He was a man of the West, cowboy, husband, father, outlaw, hired assassin, lawman, and lone wolf. This deputy sheriff and horse wrestler was a true pioneer of Hot Springs County, Wyoming. The pioneers of outlaw country, cowboys, lawmen, and outlaws, to the businessmen and women who all helped shape Jamopolis and Hot Springs County, Wyoming. Here are their stories. Albert Slicknard, lawman and outlaw. With four other Wyoming lawmen, Deputy Albert Slick Nard snuck into the camp under the cover of darkness to confront his former partner, the notorious horse thief, Jack Bliss. As the first rays of sunshine lit up the sky, Jack, unaware of the danger lurking outside, emerged from the cabin into the cool, crisp morning. His companion, Kid Collier, had already strolled away to take care of their horses, a bucket of oats in his hands. They were just over the border of Utah from Evanston, Wyoming, and thought they were safe along the Bear River. Suddenly, a voice called out, Put your hands up! Deputy Slick and the other lawmen leveled their Winchesters. Bliss died back into the cabin as shots rang out. The kid was too far away from cover and his hands flew up in surrender, unaware he was about to be used as a human shield. War had been declared. It was the spring of 1892 in the Wild West. Stockmen and law enforcement had announced boldly to the press that they were in a war of extermination against horse wrestlers across Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. In their campaign to defeat the thieves, the vigilantes hired outlaw informants, and the local lawmen deputized the very horse wrestlers they fought against. Sometime in December 1891, Slick turned on his former companions, including Butch Cassidy, in exchange for his freedom. Who was this Albert Slick Nard, the horse rustler turned deputized sheriff? Albert Nard was a cowboy of Dutch heritage who arrived in Wyoming around 1884 when he was in his early 20s. Throughout the years, he was known by many names in the press. Albert Nord, Sam Bernard, Al Slicknard. The New York Times claimed that Slick, as he was most commonly called, graduated from a Texas penitentiary before his arrival in Wyoming. Nard did have a brother, Samuel, who broke out of jail in Huntsville, Texas in 1889 and fled to Wyoming. He was later jailed in 1901 for murder. Whether or not Slick himself was an ex-con or was just mistaken for his brother Sam, it is generally agreed that Slick Nard had come off the trail from Texas just as a severe drought seized the Lone Star State. Thanks to several new laws, government land in drought-free Wyoming was available for free or at an extremely low cost. Homesteaders could file claims and have property of their own after three to five years of making improvements, even if it were as little as planting a tree. In 1884, the same year Nard arrived, more people filed for land claims in Wyoming than in the previous 14 years combined. The free-range era for cattlemen was coming to an end, and the stockmen were not willing to lose all that land without a fight. The first rumblings of war against these intruding homesteaders were beginning to brew. On the trail from Texas, Slick would have been one of about a dozen men with a trail boss leading them along a mile-wide swath of land. The typical Texas herd consisted of about 2,000 head of cattle. 
and often these herds would grow as they passed along the countryside, adding strays to their herd. Ranchers along the trail complained about these cowboys incorporating their stock, but the practice continued. Tempers began to flare. Cowboy William Owens explained the process. Our orders were to pick up two strays for every one we lost in a stampede and put the iron on the animals. The cowboys were paid $1 for every extra cow they were able to hold in their herd. Life on the trail was hard and the pay was poor. This bonus encouraged the boys to have eye trouble. They would ignore the fact that the mavericks were actually older calves running with branded cattle. The cowboys lived out in the open, beneath the wide open sky, without tents, tarps, or slickers. There were three or four horses per cow hand, and these were often broken-backed nags. On the trail, there was no way of preserving beef, except for the occasional slow elk, a cow belonging to another outfit, the menu was limited to items which could be preserved. Beans, biscuits, and coffee were a constant staple in the cowboy diet. A trail delicacy, SOB stew, was made of tallow, tongue, liver, brains, marrow gut, and anything else the cook could make edible. After coming up this well-traveled trail from Texas, Slick most likely remained working for various ranch outfits as a cowhand, and laborer. He would have continued picking up stray mavericks, a practice that had just been made illegal in 1884 by the Wyoming Stock Growers Association and the Wyoming Legislature. In 1886, the drought from Texas hit Wyoming and the cattle boom ended in a bust. The weather turned crispy dry in the summer and iron cold in the winter. There were too many cows and not enough grass on the range. Wyoming historian T.A. Larson estimated that by the time the drought hit, there were 1.5 million cattle in Wyoming. 15 to 25 percent of these herds were lost. Four years, said rancher John Clay, you could wander amid the dead brush wood that borders our streams. In the struggle for existence, the cattle had peeled off the bark as if legions of beavers had been at work. Despite these hardships, many of the pioneers, farmers, and ranchers hung on to their livelihoods in Wyoming. Unemployed cowboys ranged the land looking for work. They hunted down stray cattle to build up their own small herds, to feed themselves, or to line their pocket with money from less unscrupulous butchers that did not see the brand. Horses were also a prime target for these increasingly desperate men. On June 24, 1888, Slick married Anne Jean Hollywood, a 16-year-old from the cow town of Hyattville. Originally known as Paint Rock, the ranching community had been established just a few years prior in Johnson County, and Jenny lived there on the family homestead. The young woman was the sixth child of 11 siblings, with an Irish father and Scottish mother with strong work ethics. Her parents had immigrated 20 years before to America, and Ginny was their first child born in their new homeland. By 1880, the Hollywood family had moved west. When Ginny was 13 years old, they settled near the ancient petroglyphs of Medicine Lodge in the rugged Wyoming wilderness. The region was remote and a haven for ranchers and outlaws. Located in the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains, the new town of Hyattville featured one store, a new post office, and about a dozen houses. Slick, however, did not settle down into a domestic life on a homestead with his wife and young family. He found other means to provide for his family that were not as legal as his in-laws might have liked. By 1890, Nard and his close friend Jack Bliss were part of the same loose-knit band of horse thieves that roamed around the Bighorn Basin. Although branded as outlaws, the men were not considered part of the infamous Wild Bunch. The Warland Grit claimed 
Nard hung out in the hole in the wall country, but generally played a lone hand. He had earned a right to be called slick through his cattle and horse wrestling. For a time, he rode with the curry gang of train robbers and was supposed to have been an actor in several of the big looting deals that the gang was responsible for. Slick's friend, Jack Bliss, was spoken about in the press as a desperate outlaw who had ousted peaceful settlers from their ranchers, stole their horses, and sometimes their daughters. In 1889, Bliss had been accused of being involved in the murder of Nelson Bump, an Idaho rancher. Bliss was a member of Teton Jackson's gang of horse thieves and, after the murder charge, moved his operation to the Bighorn Basin. The press called Bliss the king of rustlers and stated that he was a remarkable, large and powerful man, bold and courageous as a wild beast. He was the most wanted outlaw by the Montana and Wyoming stockmen turned vigilantes who had declared war on the horse rustlers by 1891. Further down on this list, Butch Cassidy and Al Hainer. One of the most outspoken leaders of the vigilantes was rancher John Chapman, who had a personal vendetta against Bliss. Chapman owned the Two Dot Ranch near the Montana line on Pat O'Hara Creek, north of present-day Cody, Wyoming. He claimed that Bliss had stolen 400 of his finest horses and offered a $500 reward for his capture and that of other horse thieves. In October 1891, when Otto Frank of Pitchfork Ranch filed a theft complaint against Cassidy and Hainer for Gray Bull Cattle Company, Chapman volunteered to track down the bandits. He was unsuccessful and returned home in late December, empty-handed. However, he had made a valuable contact in the person of Slick Nard, currently a horse thief at Lost Cabin. It is not known exactly when and where Chapman met Slick, but Chapman gave the outlaw an ultimatum. Help put the gain out of business or enjoy a long stretch of prison in Laramie. Slick accepted the offer and became an informant. Thanks to Slick, Chapman now had intelligence on the wrestlers, including the last known whereabouts of Butch Cassidy. On March 1, 1892, John Chapman arrived in Billings and boldly told the press that he was there to prepare for the spring campaign against the outlaws. Two months before, in January 1892, Sheriff John Ward of Uinta County, Wyoming, had spotted Jack Bliss near the Utah border. The wrestler disappeared before he could be arrested. In March, shortly after Chapman's declaration of war, Sheriff Ward discovered that Jack was staying at the Marks Hotel in Evanston, registered under the name John Walker. Ward fired off a telegram to Sheriff Charles Stowe in Fremont County. It was well known that a $500 reward was being offered by Chapman, and Stowe immediately formed a posse to board the train for Evanston. This posse included his new deputy sheriff, Slick Nard. Slick's wife, Jenny, and children were now living in Lander as he joined the opposite side of the law. The other men in the posse were Edmore LeClaire, a half Shoshone scout who had fought in the Indian Wars, and Marion Franklin Olive, who lived not far from Stowe's ranch on the Sweetwater. Sheriff Ward and his deputy, Robert Calverly, joined the posse. The lawmen followed the Bear River north for 25 miles to a cabin just across the Utah border. Slick and the other deputized lawmen arrived at three that morning and hid until dawn. Bliss's fellow horse thief, James Irvin, Kid Coiler, appeared first with a bucket of oats. The posse held their fire as the kid strolled toward the picketed horses to tend to his chores. Next, Bliss came out of the cabin into the crisp morning. The lawmen leveled their Winchesters and ordered Bliss to put his hands up. Startled, Bliss dove back into the cabin as shots rang out. With nowhere to run, the kid immediately gave himself up. 
Sheriff Ward grabbed the outlaw as a human shield and moved toward the cabin with his six shooters on the shoulders of Kid Collier. Bliss surrendered. It was reported that the lawman recovered 62 stolen horses in the corral. This was the first battle of the war against horse rustlers, and it had ended in success. After the shootout, the Salt Lake Tribune noted there are a few more of the game yet to be captured. Leaving the catch of stolen horses at the nearby town of Randolph, Sheriff Stowe and Ward took their prisoners to the Evanston Jail. In the meantime, Deputy Calverly headed towards the Jackson Hole area to arrest the next horse rustlers on the list, Butch Cassidy and Al Hainer. After a shootout, they too were arrested, in part thanks to the intelligence provided by their former ally, Slick Nard. Butch and Cassidy joined Bliss in the Evanston jail. In April, Bliss and Kid Collier were taken to Lander to face charges of horse theft and murder. The jail did not hold Jack Bliss for long. He escaped on May 16th by knocking down and disarming Deputy John Houghton. Collier was captured that evening, but Bliss remained free. Bliss followed the Badwater up to the Lost Cabin country, and it was there that he stole, or was loaned, Manuel Armenta's famous racehorse, Redbird. Armenta was a suspected horse thief that, like Nard, had been deputized. Armenta joined the posse to supposedly capture Bliss, his former associate, and rescue his prized horse. Thank you for joining us for part one of Albert Slick Nard, Almond and Outlaw. Join us next time as Deputy Nard joins in the chase after his former friend, Jack Bliss, slides back into the outlaw life himself. Thank you for listening to Pioneers of Outlaw Country. I am your host, Jackie Dorothy, with special thanks to author and historian Mike Bell. Be sure to subscribe to Pioneers of Outlaw Country so you don't miss a single episode of this historic series. The stories of our pioneers were brought to you by the Hot Springs County Pioneer Association. And this podcast was supported in part by a grant from Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund, a program of the Department of State Parks and Cultural Resources. This is a production of Legend Rock Media.